Hey, everybody out there. Well, <laughs> um, I don't need to see me. They're just thinking of me. <laughs> whatever you prefer. No, whatever you prefer. So thank you for coming today. Um, we started looking for somebody to help us do a fair housing training um, back in um, April because April is Fair Housing Month. And uh, it's a lot harder than I expected. Um, and people don't know as much about it as you would think that they would. So um, let me introduce Deborah. Deborah is the managing attorney of the Johnson City Office of Legal Aid of East Tennessee. She has represented clients in the Upper East Tennessee area in civil matters for the past 26 years. Deborah is a graduate of the University of Tennessee College of Law. She is a member of the Domestic Violence State Coordinating Council. She's the recipient of the 2010 Advocate of the Year from the Tennessee Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence and the 2013 Ashley T. Wiltshire Public Service Attorney of the Year. She's pretty honest. So thank you for agreeing to come and speak to us today. And I'm gonna turn it over to her. So we'll, we'll, we're gonna we're doing this by Zoom too. And then after her presentation, we'll take questions from everybody and hopefully have everybody out of here in an hour. So is this the uh, just how I do my slide? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Oh, so thank you so much. So yeah, you're fine. Um, first of all, just a little update, okay? Because that bio actually is a little. I've actually been with Legal Aid 33 years of December. Um, I am now the deputy director. Um, I still, I still practice law. I still do cases. Um, and the rest of that, the rest of that is up to date. But um, I have, uh, I still manage the Johnson City office also. But I'm also the deputy director. Um, time marches on, and it's hard to believe that as some of you have probably been in your job for a long time, but um. 33 years, so uh, that just means one thing, I'm getting older. <laughs> <laughs> no, you there you go, I like that, okay. There you go, exactly. So um, now we do some, we do fair housing cases in uh, legal aid, and so and I am Amber. not by any means an expert, um, but we're gonna talk through this and, and uh, uh, go through this together. I have done a couple, a few cases, um, and so, um, I want to share with you my knowledge and I'm, I'm open to questions at any time. And I'm also um, open to any kind of discussion about anything. So, um, cause this is a learning experience, but you guys have right here, um, for those of you that are in the room um, or not, um, the Federal Fair Housing Act. I think most of us know what it's about, but we might not know how we actually put it into place or what exactly who is under the Fair Housing Act, what does it do? But the Federal Fair Housing Act prohibits discriminate, is, is, is there to prohibit discrimination in housing because of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, familial status, okay? Or disability. Now, in 1968, when the original Fair Housing Act was passed, let's see what my next slide, um, there was not all of those were included. So, Originally, all that was included in the Fair Housing Act was race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. Um, since then, it has been amended so that we now have others, which actually, what do you think of all those, and this is, I like to have a little interaction too, so what do you think of all those race, color, religion, sex, national origin, familial status, um, or disability would be the most claims have been filed um, in the past few years, uh, under um, of those um, of those different discriminatory actions, what would you what do you think? Disability. Disability. That's exactly right. Disability. Yes. Okay. Um, so the policy it's the policy of the United States to provide within constitutional limitations for fair housing throughout the United States. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the protected classes. The protected classes um, are race. Some of these are, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Some of these are really easy, you know. Um, the color of somebody's skin, that's pretty easy, right? Uh, to determine whether somebody is um, uh, Caucasian or African-American or Indian or something of that nature. Um, you know, look at their skin, we see the color, we determine whether or not they, you know, we can determine pretty easily they've been discriminated against because of that color. Well, let me rephrase that. We can determine pretty easily that their color of their skin is different. Sometimes determining whether or not they've been discriminated against is a little harder. 
Would you be willing to share some of these slides afterwards with those of us in attendance so that we can share that with our staff? Definitely not. No, of course. <laughs> I mean, you have to come to my office and do the presentation then. So one or the other. Sure, of course. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Um, race, okay. Race is fairly, you know, easy to not as maybe not as easy as color. I, I think the easiest one up there is color. Race, um, we're gonna talk a little more about, but we can look at a person and sometimes determine whether they're of a different race. Um, religion, now that gets um Ooh, that can get, ooh, that, as we all know. Um, it says religious beliefs or practices of the individual. Does that just mean anything that they believe in? Any, um, that's where it gets kind of you. National origin, that's pretty easy, right? Um, where they were born, except, except sex. Now, if you think of sex as female, male, most of the time, that's, Pretty easy, but not all the time, is it? Um, uh, we've seen, I know I've seen, you've seen um, probably somebody that you might think was a woman who biologically is probably a male, um, but is in being clearly discriminated against because of that. You might ask, well, does the act cover that? Well, we'll see. Familiar status, we're going to talk about in disability, we're going to talk about, okay? Oh, sex is really early here, so um, <laughs> I didn't mean that quite like it sounded, but um, sex discrimination is one of those that was a, that was amended in the Fair Housing Act in um, the, the later amendment, okay? But even since that, when it was originally amended, it meant just what most of us think, female, male, okay? So because back in the early years, um, women were discriminated against, you know? Um, single women, uh, uh, women, uh, women who maybe had a lot of children, but women, period, uh, just females were discriminated against. And so basically it meant male or female. Um, since that time, the, um, there are new guidelines and it, uh, HUD will investigate complaints on the basis of conduct directed towards an individual based upon that individual's sexual orientation and or gender identity where applicable. Um, Basically, I wanted to read because I thought it was very interesting why um, the act was amended to include uh, some of this didn't, I didn't have on my PowerPoint. But. So in the memorandum, it says that HUD recognized that courts and governments have routinely withheld legal legitimacy from loving couples because of their sex and denied many persons the freedom to express a gender that defies norms. These injustices have perpetuated across our civic institutions, the workplace, the marketplace, places of education, and many others. But among the most personal and fundamental of these institutions is housing, where when granted the protection of fair housing law, we can all enjoy the happiness and freedom to love whom we choose and to safely express who we are. So Hudson Memo said that this was in 2021, that effective immediately, it would investigate complaints of discrimination because of gender identity or sexual orientation of types of sex discrimination under the Fair Housing Act. So if, um, if I went and applied for fair housing and uh, or for housing, not fair, if I went and apply for housing at an apartment complex here in Bristol, and I had uh, my wife with me and we openly talked about, you know, I, that we were a couple and that we were applying for an apartment and then we were denied. And then I found out later that shortly thereafter that the next male and female were given an apartment and that the next um, um, two women who clearly were not um, uh, partners or were not uh, married or whatever were given an apartment and on down the line. Um, have I been discriminated against under the Fair Housing Act? Yes, I have. Yeah, probably so. That, and, and, and the thing is, though, is just like a lot of things, um, sometimes it's hard to prove. You know, and you can't, I can't just file a HUD complaint and say, um, oh, by the way, we went to, my wife and I went to this apartment complex and we, we applied and we didn't give an apartment and we've been discriminated against. Well, I ain't gonna cut it, you know, because how can I prove that we, I, you know, I might think we were, I might be able to say, well, you know, and when we went and applied, uh, this man said, made comments that made me 
it made it real easy for me to believe that he didn't give us an apartment because we were a couple. Um, but you got to have pretty much more than that, you know, and we'll, we could talk about that. But just so you know, um, that has been added. And, and so now sex means more than just male, female. It means quite a variety. So if the landlord that you all went to meet with and go through said, I'm sorry, I don't rent to same sex couples, then that would be. That would, right. yeah. But most landlords are smart enough to know better to do that. But yes, exactly. Then, then I wouldn't need anything else. That would be as clear as mud. <laughs> uh yeah i mean i follow a complaint saying hey he's he just said i don't you know and then if i can follow that up with or you know we're going to talk about but you, you can follow a complaint with how you can file a lawsuit but then if i can follow up with the fact that um in the history since that landlord's been there there have never been rented to anybody you know or if i know somebody who's gone there and sometimes what the way that we that this is done is you send test people in there uh, so, like, if this happened, and then, um, you know, or if I, let's say I went to apply, and I, and I didn't really, you know, I'm just in there as a test person, and then we send the next test people in there, and he immediately or she rents to them, there's, you know, they tell me there's no apartment available, and then these people get them, uh, that's a, tomorrow. right, then that's a pretty good indication that he didn't rent to, he or she didn't rent to me, because I came in as, Show you know, say we came in as a same sex couple. Well, and that's true of anything that we're trying to show, be it race, be it whatever. But um, okay, so what do we talk about when we talk about familial status? What does that mean? Uh, because you can't not discriminate against because of familial status. So, so one or more persons under 18 living with a parent or other person with custody, or a person chosen by the parent or person with custody with written permission. And it also includes a pregnant person somebody in the process of securing legal custody or has minors with them so basically you know um i hate to say it i'm i sometimes want to being um older and being um a person without children i like to go to the beach or some to dollywood or something when it's not so busy and i don't just mean children but i mean people you know but a lot of the um and that's that's my choice and my preference but that doesn't mean that i can and i don't have anything against children don't get me wrong i love children but you know i can't decide that i'm going to have a home uh, or, or a rental property that's going to be for people that don't have children that's just you know so you cannot do that i cannot do that you can do that in certain and we're going to talk about the exceptions a little bit okay but for apartment complex or um um housing units or things like that you cannot decide that you're just going to rent it you cannot decide you're just going to rent to older people. You cannot, except there are a few exceptions. Like, yeah, I maybe just have one home, I can do that. If I have a whole lot of places or, or a landlord or an apartment complex or something, you cannot. You cannot put up a sign that says, we rent to male and female married couples without children. Okay. Even if you believe that two people living together should be married. You know that's your religious belief and you don't think that two people that are you know male even if it's just male and it's female you know you're um and they're not married what do you think about that can you say no you can't have this place why is it discrimination where does it say in the law that for, that people have to be married Oh my gosh, because these days more people are not married than are married. And you know, I'm, I'm as I've worked, would you ask, if you would have asked me when I went to work at Legal Aid when I was oh, 26 years old, um, you know, should people be married? You know, should I probably would have said, yeah, you know, man and woman, I should, you know. Now that I've worked at Legal Aid for 33 years, um, it's a whole lot easier when you're not, you know. Um, I've seen literally couples who, who have spent years together and get married and it falls apart. Um, I had, I represented a man who, um, um, in a tax case, who um, had a partner and they had four children and he, they were just like a married couple, but they were afraid to actually make that next step because they had seen so many of their friends who had gotten to that point and it fell apart. Work, living that way worked for them. Um, he was as committed as any husband could be. He took care of his children. Um, they were, they just hadn't had that legal 
they were committed to each other, but they hadn't gone before a judge or a priest or, or a minister or whatever. Um, and I've seen it happen too. So now in my older years, um, I don't, what works for people, you know, I mean, if, if it works for you not to have that, then so be it. But we cannot, yeah, we cannot discriminate against the government. Yeah. Deborah, isn't that like common marriage after so many Well, years? in the state of Tennessee, we don't have common marriage. Oh, okay. But in Virginia, we, there's a way you, you know, I don't know Virginia law, yeah. but they may. I mean, it may. Some states do have common law marriage, where if you've been together so many years, according to, and each state can be different, then you're considered married. But in the state of Tennessee, we don't have common law marriage. Disability. Oh, my. <laughs> um. So disability status, what is the meaning? A physical or mental impairment which substantially limits one or more major life activity, activities, a record of an impairment, or being regarded as having such an impairment, whether a person has an impairment or not. So what does that mean, right? Most people who have a disability, um, and not all, but the easiest way is to just that you have a record. They get Social Security, they can show that they have a record, um, or some people have, believe it or not, have disabilities and actually work. Um, because it substantially limits one or more major life activities, but that doesn't mean necessarily that they cannot work. Um, we like to think of disability as something that we can see, right? But that is not. I mean, lots, lots of people have disabilities that if you meet them and you see them, you, you have no clue. Because um, we have people have mental disabilities. People have physical disabilities that are that's something that you can't see, you know, their heart's not working or, um, you know, uh, some, they don't have um, good uh, blood flow, so they can't walk, um, you know, things that, so you cannot um, just determine whether or not somebody is disabled by just looking at them. Um, so, um, as I told you earlier, disability is the biggest, uh, reason people are, are discriminated against and the biggest um, filing of HUD complaints that there is. What is, and you may not know this, but of the complaints that are made, what percentage are founded? I don't know that. Okay. All right, so these are some examples of persons that were considered to be persons with disability. People suffering from Alzheimer's. Okay, so that's one of the disabilities I'm talking that you can't see. If you just meet somebody, now if you talk to them for 20 minutes, you may real, mm, you know, they've got an issue, but you might not know it's Alzheimer's, but and maybe not. You know, some Alzheimer's patients can, you know, 20, 30 minutes they can do. Um, but that's not something that we can see. People suffering from senile dementia and organic brain syndrome. Uh, people limited by mental retardation, elderly people suffering from chronic illness, people with schizophrenia, people diagnosed with HIV or another infectious disease. When we meet somebody, we don't know what their HIV status is or if they have some other kind. Of, well, let's use COVID now, okay? Um, you don't know when you meet somebody if they have COVID or not, but I don't think COVID in itself uh, for the time for the sickness of COVID and having it for for a brief time would actually be a disability, but people who have had COVID and who have been in the hospital and it has affected them and caused some other problems, yes. And people who are mobility impaired. Sometimes, as I said, it's very easy to see somebody who's disabled, you know, they're in a wheelchair, can't walk or um, different, they've lost a limb or different things like that. But I would say, no, I don't, I don't want to get out. I don't want to step out and say that, but I would say a large majority of disability is not physical disability. What about PTSD? Um, I think I would say yes. I would hope so. But you would have to have something, right? You know, right? Yeah. But a yes, a lot of people do. Yes. Oh gosh, yes, yes. That, a lot. I mean, yes, that would definitely be it. All right. So who's covered? I mean, what are we talking about uh, as far as you know, housing or whatever? So rental, the rental of housing, the sale of housing, the lending money for housing, the insurance of housing. All areas connected with residential housing. So not only is it rental, but uh, in the sale of a home, you can't discriminate. Banks can't discriminate when they lend money. And you know, sometimes um, these days, um, 
when a, when you're trying to get a mortgage or something like that, they ask you and then they tell you you don't have to ask answer the questions. They'll say, you know, what sex are you, male, female, or don't want to answer? Um, what 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 uh, race are you? You know, white, whatever, don't want to answer. Uh, because of that issue, because in the past it has been an issue that where banks or lending agencies may discriminate against people just simply because of who they are. So these are some covered dwellings, and I'm not going to read all those to you, but it's pretty much every everywhere. There are some exceptions, and we're going to get into that, but um, they're not many. So, what is temporary shelters? Mm. Do you know? Oh, uh, yeah, like the Isaiah House. Oh, okay. um, like, so would that um, be like Salvation Army? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, can they determine that certain people can't come in? Because of these, no, it covers that. Group homes, every, you know. Okay, so I have a question. Say you have somebody with an apartment over their garage that they want to rent. Mm -hmm. So they cannot choose who they want to rent. So let's talk about the exception. I think I read that that would be an exception. So that's okay. I'm looking at. I didn't mean to get ahead. No, 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 you're fine. <laughs> So sometimes it's better to take it as it comes up. Well, and the thing is, what if that, um, what if it's a two bedroom, but the person in the home and the apartment doesn't want children because the steps are steep or whatever they prefer? Can they say we're only going to rent two adults? Okay, so this says this one with the Fair Housing Act applies to most housing. There are a few exemptions to the Fair Housing Act. One is a dwelling with four or fewer units. If the owner lives in one of the units, however, it is important to note that these dwellings are, oh, this was some further. And then single family housing sold or rented without the use of a broker if the private individual owner does not own more than three such single family homes at one time. Um, the best thing to go by, um, I, in my opinion, is it, 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 um, it applies because the, the exemptions are so few. Um, Single family homes, so long as the home is sold or rented by the owner, the owner does not own more than three of this type at home at one time. The advertising for the rental of property for sale was not discriminatory, and the owner did not use a broker or real estate agent. So if you're selling your home on your own, it's the only home you own, probably not. Okay. Rooms or units in a building with a maximum of four units, so long as the owner lives in more than units. Um, rooms or units directly or indirectly owned by a religious organization, so long as preference is only given on the basis of that membership and membership in that religion is not restricted by race, color, or nationality. Rooms or units owned by a private organization for non-commercial use, so long as preference is only given on the basis of membership and membership in that organization is not restricted by race, color, or nationality. Is that like, because there's like um, senior retirement places where they don't allow children. And people may have to be over 55. I so, think if that if, if I believe that that would be, um, be a membership. Yes. Okay. As long as you weren't, as long as they didn't discriminate because of race, color, or nationality. Okay. Basically, if I'm ever in that situation, I'm just calling you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> make sure. And then if I can't, then we'll reach out to others. <laughs> All right, so refusal to sell rent after making a bona fide offer, refusal to negotiate or otherwise make unavailable or deny because of race, color, original things that we talked about. That's the time, 42 USC, that's just the, the code section of the law up there. That's the fair housing law. Right. All right, so it's conduct that is prohibited, delaying tactics in sale or rental, creating different harder procedures in the application process, Grudgingly making housing available or making people feel unwelcome. We don't want to lower the price or take a second mortgage when the seller might do it for somebody else. I will put your name on a waiting list when there is no waiting list and units are available. We decided not to sell. So, you know, that last one, like um, if my wife and I went and we made an offer and um, they decided not to sell, and then a week later, the same offer was made to. And I'm just using this as an example, just a heterosexual couple. Um, then they they discriminated against us. Um, or a black person, black or black and white, you know, goes and um, makes the same offer, and then they say, "Oh, we decided not to sell." 
The next week, same offer is made to a white couple. They've been discriminated against. Now I'm talking the same offer. It's a, you know, I mean, we decided not to sell, and the next week somebody offers them ten thousand dollars more. Well, that might change their mind, you know. Uh, but if the next week the same couple offers the same exact thing, I think they would start to start to set them up. Oh, definitely have a case. Any questions about those? Pretty. I'm assuming I, I don't know how the people that are listening to me um, are asking. Okay, thank so you. you've got yeah. some chat. Oh, I see it so there. We're yeah. going to hit that. We're doing at the end. end. Okay. okay. I wasn't even looking so up there, but now. I just check um, with people. They can hear. Everybody's good. Usually, no, you started. Usually, hearing's not an issue when I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. All right. Um, Conduct that's prohibited is difference in terms, conditions, privileges of sale, or rental of a dwelling, or provision of services or facilities, okay? Because of all the things we talked about. All right, so demanding higher rent or prices, applying different terms, denying facilities or services, providing more favorable conditions to certain class over the other. Um, you can't take your children to the pool ever. You can only have one child living with you in a two-bedroom apartment. We have rules about who can visit and we do not allow, allow farm workers here. You know, one of the um, one of the biggest issues that we see in um, public housing, especially, um, is visitation, you know, um, because they say they have rules. And I know that the rules are there to keep people from living in there when they're not on the lease. Um, but we see a lot of, um, of cases where you know they're evicting them because they had a visitor who was there for a week or so, and then they call us and they say, "Oh, they were just here for a couple of nights, and they were visiting. They were staying because we needed help with this or that." Um, so that is a huge issue, but not not necessarily. It's not a discrimination issue always that we see. It's just a violation of the rules, and I think it's more of a somebody's trying to let more people live there than are supposed to be living there. Um, you can't take your children to the pool ever. Um, you know, I can, uh, what, that takes me back to when there was probably, don't get me wrong, we still have it. We definitely still have racial discrimination, but, you know, when black children were allowed to be in the pool or drink from the water fountains or, you know, um, I can't even imagine, but believe me, it's alive and well. Discrimination is alive and well in, in uh, many of our counties, trust me. Um, as we know, not around here, maybe, but some of the counties that I go to, um, you never ever even see a black person because they just know you don't live in that county. And that's sad to think that we're in the year 2022 and we still have areas that way. It's not, and not just black people, anybody that's not white, anybody that doesn't look like any of us sitting in this room, you know? So what, are, what about the, Maybe I missed it, but that if you have children, you have to have a minimum of a two bedroom apartment. Is that true? Not not for the one. If they've got two bedrooms, they can have more than one child. But if they only have, is there a rule so that parents are not sleeping with their children? There is no law that says that children can't. Uh, um, you know. That's what I've heard. There is no law. Uh, if these, well, you know, my mom grew up, my mom had three sisters and they grew up in a, it was a three bedroom house, but it was, it's, you know, street, so two sisters, sure, right. you know. Right. Today, if, uh, let's say there was two girls and two boys. Oh, no, no, let's say there was three boys and one girl. And so one boy had to share a room with one of the girls. Okay. There is no law that says that, but if DCS were to come and investigate, DCS, before they let you have your children back, would require that you have separation of that. Okay. And does that start at a certain age? It does. Yeah. I mean, they just, I mean, I don't, there's no, I am not aware of a law, but DCS would just say, and some judges would agree. And sometimes I do a lot of GAO work. And in some cases, I would, I would, require that. I mean, if I've got a 16-year-old boy who's sharing a room with a 12-year-old girl, I'm not going to agree to that, you know? Um, if I've got two, if I've got a five-year-old boy sharing a room with a five-year-old girl, I'm not as concerned. Um, if I've got, a, if I've got um, a, a three-year-old who's sleeping in a, uh, in, a, in a small bed in her parents' room, 
because that, that's all they have. I'm not too concerned about that. If I've got a 14 year old who's sleeping in his parents' room, I'm concerned about that. So it's just, you know. Well, I heard some of our newer apartment complexes that say if you have children, you have to have a two bedroom apartment. I don't think that's a law. So there's some public housing rules. I don't know what this wouldn't be public housing, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, public housing has to, there's a state who can make it. Because this like example is, you house. can only have um, one shop. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, you know, maybe that is internally what they do, because if they didn't, what would stop someone if they, a mom and two kids, or, and that's all they can find, or all they can afford moving in, and yeah. I don't know. I don't think they could do that, because I think that would be the familial status discrimination. You can't tell somebody that they have to have two bedrooms. Yeah. And what if you choose, I mean, I've been in some homes, because like I said, I do a lot of GAO work, where the parent, the adults are sleeping in the living room or something, and letting yeah. the kid have the bedroom, because that's all they can get. That's true. Yeah. You know, who says you have to have bedrooms? The, um, number I don't I don't know if you all can hear me, but maybe well I don't I don't think that's or you put the kid in the living room. Just because it's a living room doesn't mean that, that has to be right or maybe exactly um, lack of housing we have here yeah. we're probably gonna say a lot more I got I got a house, I got a case right now that I'm you know we're looking at really seriously because it's a mobile home. It has two bedrooms and there are six kids. And you know, but they've got bed to bed to bed. And so I'm like, is it more important that they have, a, a, you know, that say there's all boys in this room? You know, is it more important that they're with their parents or that they're in foster home and they have extra beds? And a roof over their head. Yeah. 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 No, they can't. I mean, they're 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 poor. You know. I mean, and even the rent for that trailer is six hundred dollars a month. You know, I'm just having trouble. I mean, these are tough times with housing, and so you, I just don't think we can tell parents that they you have to have a, a room per kid. I mean, we, I mean, that didn't happen when my parents were growing up. Things have room. changed. We had three bedrooms, but my sister and I shared a room. Yeah, you know? I mean, like so, yeah. So I really, it really to me as a GAL, it, it depends on the situation okay. now depends on the kids their ages how we've had them but if i've got three girls in a room i'm not too worried um not that something can happen don't get me wrong but you have to just you know um but if i've got a 16 year old boy and a 14 year old girl or if i've got a 16 year old girl and a 14 year old boy i'm not going to let them share right but we all know we've been there you know you have curiosity and feelings and you know things were happening and it's just don't no, no, i mean while it can happen anyway let's not just put them in a room together and turn off the light and expect them to you know not want to explore you know so let's not make it even easier than it could be yeah I'm it in okay we also can't print publish advertise you know you can live here as long as you're white and you're married and you don't have any children and you don't have a disability. Come on in. Not a good plan. All right, newspaper ads, it's a whites only or white home. I don't think we'll see that anymore. I think people are smart enough not to do that, okay? Um, we don't rent to families with children. You can't take your children to the pool ever. You can all it's kind of the same thing. We will not sell our house to a Hispanic family. I think your friends have AIDS, so I won't rent to you. So, you know, clearly, clearly that has to be a discrimination on somebody that appears to be gay, right? Because how would they even, let's say Lisa walked in to rent somewhere and say, I don't think, I, I think your friends have AIDS. We're not going to, come on. So it's not so much AIDS, it's the, it's the what they're, what they're referring to. Yes. What about dead bugs? Oh Lord, have mercy! That is a huge issue. <laughs> if I never heard the word dead bugs again in my life. It is. It's not. It's a problem. What about them? What's your question? Is that, can you deny because it looks like you have bed bugs, or because your previous uh, I checked you out and showed that you had bed bugs? No, I say no. Can you evict because you didn't? You, if you could prove as a landlord you did not have bed bugs when the family moved in and now they have bed bugs, that's what we run into yeah. a lot. Can you, the family, can the, the they? Can, I think they can attempt to evict them if they, but 
what what we normally do is we we make the landlord uh, provide you know uh, do something about the bed bugs, and if they continue to be an issue, um, we try to work something out. But bed bugs is a huge problem too. It is a huge problem, and I think it just again it just depends. I don't know that landlord. We argue against it, um, but a lot of it would depend on the judge and depend on the circumstances. But I don't think you can deny renting to somebody because you think they might have bed bugs. Because to me, that's so. Let's look at that. Where? Well, let's just talk. Where would they fall under one of our categories? Let's just say. Let's just use as an example Lisa, because she's just a good example. <laughs> um, but you know, and what if Lisa went in? And um, what are the what is the likelihood that a landlord's going to say, to Lisa, Mom, you look like you have bed bugs. I'm not going to rent. Not not very likely. But what if one of I don't know what all of you do, but I assume you all probably have the same clientele that I have, and Lisa has. One of our clients who walks in who looks poor and you know doesn't have the best clothing on and their hair hasn't been washed in several days, and then they say to them, No, I'm not gonna rent to you. And maybe don't say it's because the bed bugs are. So what do we have to do? We really have to look and see if it falls under one of these categories because bed bugs is not covered here, is it? Yeah, cleanliness. No, cleanliness is not covered here. Even money is not covered. Well, especially if like Margaret said a minute ago. They may require references, mm -hmm. and if the references say, "Oh, well, don't rent to them," they got to know, like the lady you were an hour right. about earlier. Exactly. I would not rent to them. Right. Can they say, "Yes, your references yes. are not good"? And yes. so I'm sorry. As long as it's not for one of these reasons, okay. yes. Okay. Because that's why you. I have people who get denied because of their credit, or mm -hmm. they left owing. Oh, they left owing money. But as long as it's not because of one of these reasons, yeah. Well, I was telling Lisa, I had a client here one time. This is a really good uh, take. I have to, I'm trying to need to be done it now, right? But um, she was an elderly woman and um, she lived, and I don't remember, but it was, and I say over here because it was back over yeah, there in a the tower, tower yeah, kind of place. Edge, but and she was a hoarder. Oh my God. And um, we're not talking about just a hoarder as far as just keeping stuff, which she did, but also like in, in non cleanliness. I mean, like you walked in and the kitchen was just, stuff these dishes and i never made it to the bathroom i refused to go that far the living room was just stuff everywhere so um they were going to evict her because of that so i made all the arguments that a person can I argue she had a disability because she did um hoarding is a disability a mental disability um and i got a social agency to come in and they started cleaning up the kitchen but it was like if you you cleaned it up within a matter of time she had it right back to the way it was um, so what eventually got her evicted was in, at the hearing is that the um, um, the fire department, somebody higher up in the fire department came and testified that it was a fire hazard. And so that safety overrides uh, because my client clearly had a disability and this mental issue. Um, and, and then the acute part of the story, she was really friendly. I mean, it really, it was one of those that, a lot of some of my clients bother stick with me more than others, you know what I mean? And, and I, 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 I lose sleep over them more than others. But she was a sweet, sweet lady. And I tried to explain to her what the problems were, but she just, you know, she just, in fact, she said, well, you can get somebody in here and they clean here, but they can't touch my living room, you know? So we were sitting at the courthouse one day. We'd been to court and she was, she kept the court dressed nicely, looking really nice and everything. And uh, we were sitting there talking and this young person came in and they looked kind of raggedy and you know, their clothes were. She said, Look at that. Who in the world would ever come to court looking like that? And I said, Well, you know what? He might think if he saw your apartment, look at that. Who in the world would ever live like that? She looked at me. She said, Touche. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that. It was hilarious. So, you know, but, you know, she, she was making assumptions and, you know. Just looking at her, you wouldn't know that her apartment looked like it wasn't. She had a horror problem. Yeah, she knew, you know. So anyway, so where were we when we started all this? But anyway, um, I, I, yes. And I think you can, as long as you don't have one of these, as long as you're not using this, then yes. But so, but then it still gets complicated. And also during the eviction moratorium, plenty of landlords still work to evict on other Oh, yes. oh, so definitely. Not oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. And you know, the thing about that, um, yes, in the legal system, 
And this is where my new attorneys have a hard time because, you know, you get out of law school and you think this is the way things are supposed to work. You know, the judges follow the law and people follow the law. And, you know, this is the way and they go in there. Yeah. You know, well, judges have different personalities and different beliefs and all. And they put, you know, so we had some during the moratorium. We had some judges who just flatly said, I'm not doing any eviction, period. The moratorium is in effect. I'm not doing them. Then we had others who said, oh, no, I'm not following that if it's this or, you know, so it, so it's a look of the draw of where you live, you know, and you would think we, we've got this law and it says this, so every judge should follow that, right? So nobody should be evicted, right? But that's not the way it happens. And I can tell a client, you know, somebody comes and talks to me and let's say they need an order of protection. I can say, well, you know, if we're in this county and in front of this judge, yeah, you're going to get it with this set of facts. If we're in this county in front of this judge, there's no way you're going to do it. And that's not the way it should be, but that's the way it is. Wow, that's interesting. Because judges have different opinions of domestic violence. And so if I have a case that's kind of, if, even if sometimes if I have a case that's really clear that there's domestic violence. Just to give you an example, we had a recent case where an elderly man and disabled in a wheelchair beat the, you know what, out of this woman. The general sessions judge gave the order of protection to her. The circuit judge, because the other side appealed it, said, well, there's no way this man could have done that to her and, di and dismissed it. So, but, and then the observation is for addictions, I would imagine whatever time, no, people don't come to you. There's tons of people that don't appeal. Oh. They don't fight their addiction. And, and it's done illegally. Oh, and there's tons of people that do come to us. And there's right. nothing we can do right. because it is what it is, you know. Um, and I think that's what we deal with a lot um, with people that call us is, um, you know, certainly we never try to give them legal advice or anything like that. We tell them who they need to get in touch with. But when they start talking about their story, you know, it's very clear that they don't know what their rights are. Right. And, you know, they tell them on Monday, well, you have to be out by Friday. And, mm -hmm. you know, and the family does everything and gets out and they're standing on Monday. Oh, Right. And they really didn't have, you know, and I think a lot of times, not always, but I think they will, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. A landlord cannot tell somebody they have to be out in a certain amount of time. And a landlord cannot put anybody out without going to court. A landlord cannot turn off the water, cannot um, uh, turn off the electricity in an attempt to evict somebody without, you know, they have to go to court. I have to get a detainer warrant and go to court. That's the only way that a person can actually be, unless they choose to leave. The other thing that we face, more so on the Virginia side, I think, from private landlords is they charge an exorbitant amount of money for a small place, and then it's just, you wouldn't live there with your, you know, you wouldn't let your animal live there or whatever, and it is just, it's just sad. Well, it's getting worse because of the, oh, yeah. of the uh, housing market right. right now. There is no place to live, so landlords, of course, are charging, as high, you know, and people are having to pay it because... So for here we've got the casino coming and there are a lot of people who are making their rental properties into Airbnbs and VRBOs. And I've also heard that, understand from our staff that some of the bigger apartment complexes are selling to national companies, seeing that that's advantageous to like a, like giving you, I mean, like a deer run or a, something like that. Like right. A big yeah. Something that instead of being our local that. landlords, right? Something that gonna, so it's not going to be landlords we have gotten to know or deal with or who might work with us for making payments right. or um, whatever. That it's going to be somebody who doesn't live here and um, doesn't care about community. Yeah, but, because they still have to follow all the law. Sure, they got to follow uh, this. But, but we're working yeah. with our agency uh, yeah. people who, and also for, for the status of apartments, that anybody with federal dollars, we have to have inspections that has to reach a certain level, which makes it a whole lot harder, as well as we've got a rental cap that just went up. That was nice. Oh, it's yeah. only about, well, it went up like $3. I know. <laughs> Oh, like, are you? Uh, oh, please, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, so, that they can say that went up. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's a plus and a minus. I mean, it means that it's harder to find, but it does mean that there are some 
So this is a real good example right here because, but this is also excellent proof. So the wife who went by herself, she's white. She was told there were several apartments for rent. Then when her husband came with her, who's an African-American, later in the day to visit, he was told, they were told that the apartments were rented and the agent said, oh, you must have misunderstood me. Yeah, so some of that's going to be harder now because um, things are going to be gone the next hour or whatever. Sure. So trying to prove. Well, like I said when I started, um, it's easy to look at, and like I just said a few minutes ago, it's easy to look at the law and say, well, the law says this, okay? It's more difficult to prove it, okay? Um, for profit, inducing or attempting to induce a person to sell or run a dwelling by representations about entry or possible entry into the neighborhood of members of a protected class. I'm kind of I'm moving along here just a little bit. So, um, I mean, this is just things we talked about, you know, um, uh, saying we're not going to sell you. A bunch of African Americans are moving into the neighborhood, so the property values are going to decrease because of it. Protected class member. What is that? Is that one of these? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. For placing leaflets around the neighborhood about who's moving into the neighborhood in order to scare people into selling their dwellings and offering to help them sell their house. Okay. We talked about this um, to discriminate against anybody, even people who are trying to sell it, even brokers, any, any people like that. Um, here's some words a refusal to sell a house to a person because the individual has AIDS. A refusal to nego negotiate the price of a dwelling because the individual is mobility impaired. I will not rent to you because I think that your friends have AIDS. I love that one. You have had tuberculosis, so I will not rent to you. The sales office is not accessible for persons who are mobility impaired. I don't know how people, your friends have AIDS. They must really know them well, you know? And you know what? I don't think that this is much. Uh, no, let me rephrase that. I, I forget that. I'm not so sure it's the AIDS now that people are, but just say if somebody went to rent and let's, you know, let's say a male went and he was dressed in drag because he prefers to live with a woman and he went and tried to rent. I can see him being denied very easily um, because they don't want those kind of people renting from them. So do you have an example of number two, a refusal to negotiate the price of the dwelling because the individual is mobility impaired? Um, well, let's say, um, uh, sure, let's, if we're looking at a house and the, the person who's mobility impaired wants to buy a house and they won't negotiate at all because they've, they've made some comment about, you're going to have to, I like my house the way it is, and you're going to have to put in ramps and you're going to have to do this and that. And obviously they're not going to negotiate with them because of it. Except for like rental. And if it's, it can only be to sell a house and a rental could be, they're, they don't, they're not going to, um negotiate well not so much rental i think as trying to sell but you know on a rental if a person who's mobility impaired comes in and we're going to talk about reasonable accommodations if they don't have a, a ramp and those kind of things they're required to put those in okay so this is about when we talked about getting a mortgage refusing to accept the co-mortgage on a note because the purchaser has aids um, or denying access to the swimming pool to a person who is mobility impaired because of that impairment. Could I interject? Um, Lynn Panella is on Zoom, I guess, mm -hmm. and she tried to speak, but y'all, we couldn't hear. And she just said when we were talking about the number of uh, bedrooms and that mm -hmm. kind of thing, she said that they have to go by their policy. She's with Crystal Redevelopment Housing mm -hmm. Board on the Virginia side. Generally, they try to give a room per child. But that's not necessarily the case. They do look at the ages of the kids. But she said sometimes families will choose to take a smaller unit just to get into housing sure. because it's not available what they need. So anyway, sure. she just asked me if I would. Because I know many clients who say, well, we're on a waiting list for oh, a three-bedroom yeah. apartment or we're on the waiting list. But yeah, you're going to take what you can yeah. get when you don't have anybody to live there. But like she said, there's no requirement that if you have three children, you have to have three bedrooms. Thank you, Kelly. We said thank you. Yes, ma'am. So for like number two, and, and this is another question, well, bears on another question I have. So denying access to the swimming pool. So say uh, there's somebody that wants to rent 
mm -hmm. you know, an apartment, they have a mm -hmm. swimming pool, they're in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And they have the, so does that mean that the owner of the um, rental units has to put in like a lift for them to be able to access? They have to reasonably accommodate them. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you said you're going to get to Yes, we're going to talk about reasonable accommodations. If I can. Okay. Speaking of reasonable modifications, <laughs> how is that? I have that. There you go. Uh, reasonable <laughs> modification to uh, so what does reasonable mean? Reasonable accommodation to rules, policies, practices, or accessible. Okay, so let's refusal to refusal to permit at the expense of the person with a disability reasonable modifications to the dwelling necessary to afford full use and enjoyment of the premises. Um so what have, so I we now we have done some of these in our office where we have sent a reasonable accommodation letter. Uh, I had we had a case where they wouldn't uh, this was in public housing and he he was in a wheelchair and they wouldn't they wouldn't build a ramp. Okay, easy and not very expensive. That's reasonable. They have to do that. So once we wrote them a letter, they did it. Um, we've had others. One of the biggest things that we see right now is um, support animals. Landlords who say you can't have a pet, but you can have a support animal, an emotional support animal. And they can't make you pay a pet fee. They can't deny you. They can't do any of those things. Okay. And I think it's become much easier to get it is as well. But, uh, but it's not just dogs and cats, you guys. Like it's it's chicken. It's we want a case with a snake. It's a horse. You want a case it's a peacock. With a snake. Yes, ma'am. It's a way we probably have to have that documentation, though, right? Yes. Right. Yeah, but that's what's easy to get. Yeah. Now. You can do it online. Yeah. And save it to Tennessee, and basically you say it is, and then it is. But they, they, but most of our cases, we actually have, we actually have a doctor's note that will say, you know, so and so needs to have this cat or this dog or something. Um, this, this snake. This snake. We didn't. It wasn't. When I say we, it was a. It was a case in Knoxville of our legal aid. But yes, she won because of a snake. Now for me, well, we don't need to go there. But a snake in my house would cause me to want to leave. You know, <laughs> yeah, it would me too. <laughs> yeah. Which brings me just real quickly. I read this article on I don't know somewhere some some reasonably factual. But she got a big old. She had a big old coat. One of those snakes, pythons or whatever you know that wrap. So she 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 was like all excited because it was starting. She let it sleep with her and it was cuddling her and wrapping her up. Yeah, it was getting ready to eat her. <laughs> so it quit after after it did this for weeks. It quit eating. It started not eating, you know. And so she was worried about her baby. So she took her baby to the vet. So the vet comes out and he says, "Ma'am," he said, "the reason that your snake is not eating and the reason that he's cuddling you is because he has been determining your size." And determining, and then he quit eating because he's getting ready to eat you. Oh my god! Wow. So, yeah, mm -hmm. and that's what they—that's what these snakes do. That's they can, you know. And I thought, yeah, kind of was okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't mean to be to each his own. Okay. All right. Um. <laughs> okay. Um. So that just talks about getting rid of things. So simple things like grab bars in the bathroom, doors that need to be widened, a ramp. Um, what else have we done? Um, support animal. Um, you know things like that. You, the landlord is required to make reasonable accommodations. Your question: Are they required to put in a a, 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 a thing in their pool? So I don't think that's reasonable. They are required, though, to let if somebody wants to be with that person and pick them up and put them in the pool and that. Yes, they cannot deny that. Okay. So they still have access. They, they have access they to the pool, but they're not the making. Future. And for safety reasons, just like in my case, um, my argument was clear that they shouldn't be able to evict her because she had a mental disability and, you know, and, and um, she was a warder. But then it became a safety issue, not just for her. But for the whole apartment complex, because if there was a fire and the fire department couldn't get in her apartment, um, and then it, you know, the, so safety reasons are, you know, safety things like that are an exception. Yeah, our code enforcement department has to go through some of those right. things. So, and, so one of the questions I thought about earlier. So, for you say reasonable. So I'm thinking if somebody in a wheelchair goes to rent, and they don't have any accessible apartments. So does the landlord have to widen all the doors, 
put in an accessible shower? No. Make all those things? No. No. Um, build a ramp. Refusal to permit a person to install grab bars. Um, refusal to permit doors to be widened. Refusal to permit removal of cabinets under the sink. Those kind of things, yes. Do they have to take out a tub? You know how much it costs to take, because I just did this in my house recently, about $15,000 to take out a tub and put a shower, you know, like, yeah. yeah. I do not think the court would find that reasonable. So they wouldn't be able, if they literally had no apartment that had, this person had to have a, a shower where the wheelchair could be put in the shower, you know, or something like that. I don't think that's reasonable. If the, they had an apartment that had the, everything the person needed, except they needed to widen one door or they needed to pull out cabinets or they needed to build a ramp, that's reasonable. Okay, so by the same token, would they have to allow the rent, the disabled renter to make those if they wanted to put in an accessible shower? So I think codes department for everybody, when you go to build an apartment complex or whatever it may be, you have to have so many ADA accessible units. So if you have an available unit and somebody comes to you um, and your ADA accessible units are already full, you have to allow them to make those changes, but they would have to pay for that. Okay. So like if that your available units were on the first floor and they were taken, the handicapped person said, well, I want to take the second floor, but I need a handicap ramp, ramp added, that person would need to pay for that ramp. Because the, the, the Developer already did his two units. They happen to be full. The person still wanted to be there. That's how I understand it. Yeah. So maybe, I bet you anything that's a newer maybe maybe not. Though, too. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on the fact. And, and again, when if I take a case here in Bristol and, and file it in front of a judge, and they say that's not reasonable. Okay. If I take the same case, and I'm just using here Johnson City, that judge says, well, that's reasonable, and that's what I'm talking about. But you know, we always have the Court of Appeals. They can determine. And usually the, when the Court of Appeals decides what's reasonable, then the judges would look at that. But I'm just saying, you know, when you have a word like reasonable, so what you're going to do is look at case law and see what people have done in the past and what how the courts have defined reasonable. Um, these things are reasonable. Putting a chairlift in the pool is not reasonable. Okay. And putting in an elevator to get to the second floor. Uh, that would not be real. Well, even a ramp to the second floor is very costly. I know. I wouldn't think that that could be. But I think that would be more arguable. Yeah. And, but like, I think, like, obviously, my husband and I we own property, but we own historic properties, and the second floor, it would be very hard for you to do that yeah. and very costly. I understand. So, um, Okay, that's what I was going to bring up the, the parking place. Let's say that you are uh, a reason a, a, a mobility impaired person, not somebody in a wheelchair, but maybe just somebody who can't walk very well and you know has has a pain or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you have they ask for a, a, a parking spot near their um, apartment, and you tell them no, that doesn't fly. No pet policy. Refusal to permit an assistance <laughs> animal to reside with a person with a mental illness is necessary to their mental well being. No can do. And we have that is one we see a lot. Um, charging a pet deposit to a person with a sight impairment to have a seeing eye dog reside with them. You know, it's interesting that a seeing eye dog we don't see very much. People are like, okay, that's that's the law, that seeing eye dog. Taking a seeing eye dog into a restaurant, people don't, you know. But it's no different for a person with a mental disability who has the required uh, documentation that their little Chi-Chi or whoever, and it doesn't have to be little. I was in a restaurant one day and this man wasn't blind and he had a huge dog. That would have been my brother. Probably. That was a circus <laughs> animal. PTSD dog is right there. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and, but he was laying right there by the table. And you know, interesting enough, I've, I've been fortunate enough to go to Europe a lot. And in Europe, having dogs in the restaurants is just commonplace. You know, they just take their dogs in there and they behave. They just sit down and you don't, you know, but nobody, it's not a, it's just, Part of their culture, we of course don't have that, understandably. But um, it's a, you know, I, again, we we associate uh, uh, assistance animals with blind people. That's what we so. But these days, they're doing it for you know people who have um, uh, diabetes, diet, anything. Yeah, in the middle of the night, their dog can trip. You know, they just have this. Um, well, and we, being so close to the VA, we have a lot of 
veterans, that's what my brother is. And yeah. there's a lot of veterans that have. Again, one of those things that we can't see, you know, we have no clue that a person has PTSD or has asthma or has whatever. Person that's blind, you know, so people just make assumptions, okay? All right, questions? That's the, this is the biggest one we see, no pets. All right, so if we make a reasonable accommodation request, we need to show that person is a person with a disability. The accommodation is reasonable by showing it will not require a fundamental alteration in the nature of the program and it will not pose an undue financial or administrative burden. Okay, so who's going to make this determination? What I think is reasonable and will not cost you an undue or financial <laughs> burden, you may think is not reasonable as the landlord is not reasonable. So that's where the problem comes in, you know, and then that's when the court has. Mm, trying to accessibility, that's pretty um it's a, it's five after, so I'm kind of moving along. Lynn says in an apartment complex, if there is no accessible unit available, they can move into another unit and then wait for another unit to become available, I guess, an ADA accessible unit. So these are just requirements for buildings that now that have to have you know yeah, accessible. Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh-huh. It, as an attorney, and my advice to you is to err on the side of caution. Because there's nothing like a big old uh, lawsuit against you, your agency, the landlord, or whatever. <laughs> I, I, most of you are with agencies. Um, that um, a fair housing lawsuit where you have discriminated against somebody, not good. And I'm not saying that you can't deny people. I'm just saying use good sense. and err on the side of caution because these people are going to be protected and should be if you if 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 it can be i'm you know most of us in here are not going to be but we know landlords who are landlords who are not going to who you know don't want to <clears throat> to rent to uh, disabled people or whatever their biases may be right okay Okay, you can't even inquire about their disability. If they say they got a disability, so inquiry, you can ask, um, you know, like with the, if they have a disability, they say I have such and such, um, then um, you can certainly get that documentation, um, but you can't just stand there and say, well, what do you have? Do you have this, 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 and this, you know, okay. Um, this is about per getting loans, not making loans for black people, taking a lot of time to process a loan, uh, because of these impediment uh, or these dis uh, disabilities or whatever, higher interest rate. <coughs> these are the exceptions I talked about. A single family house sold or rented by the owner, unless the owner has more than three at that time. There is more than one sale within 24 months. And the owner has an interest in or there is reserved on the owner's behalf, title to or any right in all or a portion of the proceeds for more than three singles. Those are exceptions. So that's not going to apply to any of the people that we deal with, most of the people that we deal with. Rooms or units in a dwelling for four families with the owner residing in one of the units, the Mrs. Murphy exception. <laughs> And I'm happy to share these slides with anybody who wants them, okay? Because we're kind of, because I've run out of time, I'm kind of going through this fast. I kind of read to you already what the exceptions were. Um, so, not most of these are not going to apply to the people that we work with. <clears throat> so, the statute of limitations. So, what do you do? Let's just talk about what do you do if you have somebody, most of you guys aren't, but if somebody wants to file a complaint, you can file a complaint with HUD um, in, in this, um, in these um, slides I've got at the end. I've got, um, how far? Yeah, there, we're almost done. Contact numbers um, to HUD in Atlanta, to the Tennessee Human Rights Commission, to the Tennessee Fair Housing Council, and to us. <clears throat> I used to work before I went to work at Legal Aid. I worked for the Tennessee Human Rights Commission. Basically, what they do is they take discriminatory complaints. They they um, 
they investigate and then they make a determination as to whether there's been discrimination or not. I remember when I, this would have been 34 years ago that I worked there. I had a young man who filed a, a, a complaint because he worked in a restaurant and his boss let women wear earrings, but wouldn't let him wear earrings. Wow. Valid complaint. Yeah. Okay, so this talk. is our last slide. Yeah, that is my so last is slide. Is it okay if we look and see yes. if there's any questions? Yes. So, Patty Herndon, who's new to our CDAC committee, I think you were talking about which one was most discriminated in first. She felt right. Oh, okay. I got and, it. Uh, Amber Torbett, who's on our home consortium board, says, What about short term rentals like Airbnb? Private homes being rented, homeowner may or may not have wheelchair access. If you've answered that, what about a traditional bed and breakfast in with more than four bedrooms for rent and day to day rentals, not long term leases? I think with the traditional bed and breakfast with more than four bedrooms, then yes, it would apply. Day to day rentals, not long term leases, um, I think it would apply to. But that's just my off the top of my head. Questions from this group? Anybody else? Um, so what is this? So, what do y'all can y'all help with landlord training if we put together a landlord group? Could y'all do some of that? Um, yes, if you, if you put it together, I'm happy to come talk to you. Uh, I would love nice to, to educate landlords. One of the biggest things landlords, the mistakes that landlords make, are some of the ones they give, they um, they don't give sufficient notice. Or they give notice and then they go and take out a retainer warrant before the notice is ended. And they cannot do that. Um, you, if you give somebody a 30 day notice, then you have to wait till the end of the 30 days. If they haven't moved out, then you can go to court and get a retainer warrant. That would really be helpful, Margaret, to have that so that not that they may not follow it, may or may not, but at least for them to kind of know. Well, it now, also means that they know to we know. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, are all of y'all here, Tennessee or Virginia? You both? We're Virginia. both. Okay, because I don't know Virginia law. Yeah. Right. I'm a Tennessee. Right. But we can reach stuff. out to yeah. you. We're uh, the legal, legal we're the, yes. And we're right. used to having to do everything twice. Yeah, I'm sure you all. Yeah. I mean, you all are strictly for uh, Tennessee, so, right? <laughs> well, not family promise, but I mean the money that we have is uh, The money that we have through the end of July after that, it's uh, right now open. Um, so also, this might be more for Christina, but um, I know that there's opportunities some places, and maybe whether it's Tennessee or not, that with new development, where the developer has to do so many um, low income, not just ADA or whatever, low income units. Depends on where their money's coming from. If it's private money, that's different from if you're using Government. government funds like does that include tips i would think that that would include tax increment financing for sure because that is government supporting because i just feel like that's something that we haven't utilized that we really because of first off we should period but particularly in our housing shortage just to try to get every single possible opportunity for increasing our low income housing. Well that's why it was created. You know, right. In we don't know area. maybe areas don't use that as they you know um, we could look at that. Our housing authority could look at that as making a condition or stipulation that they Actually, you know, your 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 uh, question, I mean, if I would come, I would love to do training for landlords just to give them an idea because um and I would think they would like it because I know they um I don't know um, some of them just like when we get a, a client who comes in and they turn the water off or something sometimes when we call them they say F you do so you know, I'm gonna do what I want to do others though are like oh I didn't know that I'll go turn it back on you know so um you know and I think the ones that 
don't know will be the ones that come to me. <laughs> the ones that say that. Right. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Well, exactly. And on the other side of the coin, I think that a lot of property developers feel like they, they are discriminated against because they're spending their funding to build this, you know, something that they're proud of, proud of. And then of course, you know, they're being told constantly what they have to have to do. Um, so I deal with some of those at home quite a bit. So um, <laughs> I do, do get that. Um, I well, think, you know what, he, um, whoever, whoever that may be, um, you know, you don't have to be, you, you, all you got to do is be fair. Basically, yeah. if you, you know, take this, if you just, you know, don't, who was that? But you know, so, yeah, so we're going to be doing a landlord trading soon. We'll get the word out. Awesome. And then I also want to mention Ella Kane, who is uh, chair for Bristol Housing and on our CDAC committee says, I don't have any questions, but I thoroughly enjoy the presentation. So thank you, Ella. I appreciate that. So does this mean this? Oh, go back. Now, does this person right here, Laura, is that anyway? Are, does she mean they're going to be doing a, a landlord yeah, presentation? Yeah, that, that's she Crystal Virginia and redevelopment for the housing authority. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, good. And she said she'd let everybody know. Okay, good. Okay. Canberra. Yes. Question. Um, I have an opportunity at times to speak to different homeowners that are seeing increasing insurance costs for their own home that um, when they question their insurance company, they say, oh, it's just something that we saw on you or, or whatever, where they may be pulling credit, credit. reports. Mm -hmm. Or if they're coming to the home and inspecting the home and saying, oh, the home needs new window because this window's broken out or there's an obvious safety concern and the insurance company is threatening to cancel insurance. Would any of that type thing fall into fair housing? <clears throat> this is just a top off the top of my head question uh, on the answer. Um, I, I want to say no, because I don't know that the insurance agencies um, qualify as somebody who falls under the Fair Housing Act. Um, that would be off the top of my head, but I can inquire. So how would I just get in touch with Christina and let her know what I found yeah, out? Yeah, she'd say, there, say right, what's 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 question, maybe be one or two. Yeah, trust me, there are persons out there who know much more about the Fair Housing Act than I do. So I have some contacts and I'll see if I can. <clears throat> but that was a great question. Um, also, Deborah, how would we know how many actual like fair housing complaints our area has received? Hang on one second. Yeah. Good question. Just wondering. I tried to, I tried to Google it, but I wasn't able to get it. So I wonder. Whatever's on the internet is true, right? Of course. I think one of the reasons why the initiative has been started with HUD here as far as the Fair Housing Initiative that they've started um, is because they've not seen a lot of cases, fair housing cases, coming from our immediate areas. And that's the reason they've reached out. They've reached out to Eastern A, and we are participating with them on the initiative that the development district is as well to get the word out about fair housing rights. Um, so I think that it's probably a very low number based on, on the reasons why that they have reached out to us. They also um, reached out to this is South Carolina, an area in South Carolina or North Carolina that is participating in this as well. But so. that's good, right? If there's a low number. Like there's like well, well, well they they think, they that think, just might mean that people are not aware like of right. abuse right. or whatever your low numbers may not mean that you don't have it. It's so if they don't know where to, right. to, to go to get help or that they can go to, right. or that they even have a lot. Yeah. It, so it could mean both. I mean, you know, it could mean that things are good, but more likely it means that people are not aware of the Fair Housing Act and are not aware of how to file a complaint. And you, you don't have to file a complaint, Laura. You can also file lawsuit. But it's the, the easier and best way is to. And actually, I, I say that, but I think um, in the past when we have filed a lawsuit, we, also, we actually also have them file a complaint with HUD. So do both. So. But 
And the answer to your question is, I don't know how, but again, I'll reach out to my contact person and ask her how we find out how many complaints have been filed in our area. Because I did find in my reading that statistic, although that was, I think it was from 2017, the statistic about the most complaints filed are from disability. <clears throat> so, but I'll ask her if there's uh, somewhere we can find out how many complaints have been filed in each region. Would you include Bristol, Virginia? Sure. Please. Where is that? <laughs> right across the street. Yeah. Well, I want to say thank you so much. I really, 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 really appreciate you. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. You made it um, made it fun. Thank if you, you can make your house yeah. fun. Yeah. So. I appreciate that. I appreciate Very it. informative. And you'll leave us some of your card. Ooh, so if I have some, keep I in yeah. touch. Let me look. All right, everybody out there in Zoom, thank you. We'll see you when we see you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it.